One, a liberal education. Historically, the orientation of school and university in Western culture has been in terms of concepts of liberal education. The differences of opinion have been with reference to what is truly liberal. The terms liberal and liberty are cognate words alike derived from Latin, liber, free. From the days of the Greek city-state through Roman culture and to the present, a liberal education has been ostensibly education for freedom and the mark of a free man. But what constitutes a free man? And what is the ground of his freedom? The question is thus inevitably a philosophical and a religious question, and all the more religious in Western culture because of the influence of Christianity. A liberal education has thus been either implicitly or explicitly a religious, but not necessarily Christian, education in purpose and structure. The question, what constitutes a free man, is also an historical and cultural question. Thus, the American college before 1860 was ostensibly geared to a Christian concept of life, while following a medieval and celibate pattern and a classical Greco-Roman curriculum aiming to produce young gentlemen in terms of the Enlightenment concept of man. Its concept of a liberal education was thus not systematic but rather traditional. A radical clarification of issues was only to come much later with the progressivists, whose greatest function perhaps was to challenge and steadily shatter the conglomerate and syncretistic character of preceding educational theory. The syncretism of the older education was furthered by its increasing irrelevance to modern culture. As Lynn White Jr., able historian and educator, has commented, the liberal education which was worked out to meet the needs of the old aristocracy of priests and nobles was essentially contemplative, focused on understanding things rather than doing things. It made a sharp distinction between liberal and vocational education. To the Greek values of truth, beauty and goodness, the Middle Ages added holiness, which was thought to be either equal to the others or a submission of them. To this has been added, and in many instances substituted, a new value, skill, not a value of ends, but of means. The change of values has thus led inevitably to a need for a new concept of liberal education. If skills, scientific and professional, make men free, then skills constitutes a liberal education. But if skills are only a necessary but subordinate part of freedom, then in themselves they cannot constitute a liberal education, however necessary to it. The question again remains basically a religious question, and to its credit, progressivism has been essentially a religious movement, as indeed has been the whole of the movements from Horace Mann to the present, to liberate man by means of a universal system of state-supported schools. There has thus been a radically important development in education as a result of the work of the progressivists and their successors, but while clarifying the issues by their assaults on the older and syncretistic philosophies, these proponents of the new education have heightened some of the fallacies of earlier years. As White has observed in speaking of the masculine and celibate education of Latin culture, Aside from natural science, this clergy was personally concerned with three problems, the individual, the states and the church. As the centuries passed, the influence of the church dwindled and higher education, apart from science, became focused primarily on the individual and the state. Today, all of our humanistic disciplines are profoundly interested in the polarity between these two. Our colleges try to graduate adequately developed persons infused with an understanding of the values of what we call citizenship, and they do a fairly good job of it. When the safety of this state is threatened, millions gladly offer to lay down their lives, but when the stability of a family is endangered, 
our college graduates often will not inconvenience themselves to preserve it. They have not been led to feel that the family is basic to their lives or the well-being of their race. The reason, in large part, is that they have been saturated with an education which unconsciously assumes that the educated person is celibate and which consequently fails to impress them with a sense of the significance of the family as the primary form of human organisation and of the importance of their participation in it. If statism is freedom, then contemporary education is thoroughly liberal, but if the superimposition of the state or the church on every order of life and every sphere of human activity is by no means to be identified as liberty, then education today is definitely illiberal. Liberty is not license, and liberty and law are inseparable, but law is not the prerogative of church or state, but rather the condition of man, an inseparable aspect of life and environment, and hence coextensive and coterminous with existence. Thus, while a truly liberal education is in terms of a basic concept of order and law, that order cannot be institutionalized or reduced to any order such as church and state, without a destruction of the liberty desired. No institution can incarnate in itself that which is a part of the total condition of life and therefore of its own existence. Wherever church or states have claimed a prior or any jurisdiction over every other sphere of human activity or institution, there has been, with the realisation of their claim, a steady diminution of liberty and the substitution of an institutional bureaucracy for law. The emancipation of education from ecclesiastical control was thus a major advance in liberal education, but a truly liberal or free education must be free also of the state from its support or control. White is correct in viewing higher education as aristocratic, masculine, celibate and statist, while calling attention to the strongly democratic nature of primary and secondary schools. On all levels, however, the status emphasis has been predominant. The state is the order of liberty, and the school is the means whereby citizens are prepared for the good life. The state has become the saving institution, and the function of the school has been to proclaim a new gospel of salvation. Education in this era is a messianic and a utopian movement, a facet of the enlightenment hope of regenerating man in terms of the promises of science and that new social order to be achieved in the state. In the United States, it was very early believed that the new federal union constituted the new order of the ages, and the dollar bill today carries this proud description of that hope. Novus Ordo Seclorum this faith was not limited to the United States, but shared everywhere by the sons of the Enlightenment, who hailed with Shelley, who declared in Hellas, 1821, that The world's great age begins anew, the golden years return. Redvold has called attention to some of the doctrines of the Enlightenment's approaching millennium. They were, first, the rejection of history of the inheritance from the past, let us wipe the slate clean and begin all over again. The clean slate concept was and is basic to the psychology of the modern era. Second, and in essence, one with the first, was a rejection of institutions and customs other than the state. Third, it held that our effort to improve life must therefore be directed in the first instance not at any supposed evil within human nature, but at the evil in the environment. Man's viciousness is a social product. Since man is basically passive, his activity being essentially responsive rather than inherently determinative. Fourth, it was and is held that by changing human institutions, human nature itself will be born again. Fifth, the new managers of man are the scientific moralists and lawgivers, the educators, the statesmen. 
The new philosophy, empiricism, led to a conception of the mind as passive, priority resting with the stimulus. Locke's clean slate concept popularized this faith. The mind receives and then acts in response and is in this sense passive and receptive. The area of initiation and creativity is the area of the stimulus, the environment. Thus, delinquency has come to be seen as no more than a response, that is, a lack of love, education or control in the environment. Human activity is hence seen as conditional and responsive, and the necessary consequence of this is not only the basic passivity, but also the ostensible malleability of the mind and of man. This means that not man, but the controlling environment is master, and that controlling environments, it is held, must be the state's and the state's school. The results has naturally been a renewed emphasis on education, but also an increasingly negative attitude towards a consistently liberal education. If man, as the empiricism of enlightenment culture holds, is basically passive and malleable, then can he be truly free? Is a liberal education possible? However formally adhered to, is it not essentially denied? An observation by White is pertinent. Seventeen years ago, the sight of a new schoolhouse adorned with feces in the remote villages of Sicily first began to sap my typically American confidence in education as such. So long as he remained illiterate, the Sicilian peasant was impervious to fascist indoctrination to control his mind. Il Duce had to teach him to read. Education is not good in itself, but may be either beneficial or harmful. Fascist education sought deliberately to indoctrinate the state's children. Marxist and democratic state educational theories are equally governed by a concept of the passive psychology of man and hence dedicated to an inherently illiberal doctrine of man. Democratic education has nonetheless dedicated itself to the ideal of liberty and the principle of a universal and liberal education through state-controlled and state-supported schools. What has been the result of this attempt and what are its presuppositions?